passage of Scripture that we will be teaching from this morning is Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. 17, 11 through 19, that's page 1045 in the Pew Bible. Interesting scene here in Luke 17. Verse 11, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go, your faith has made you well. Turn your Bibles this morning to back to Luke chapter 17. We open God's Word because we want God to speak to us, and this is where God speaks to us from His Word. The Gospel of Luke, written uh, by Luke to convince his readers that Jesus is the promised Messiah, and that He is the Savior of the world. This is the one that was prophesied. This is uh, the Messiah, the one that came to build, to bring in the kingdom the one who came as our Savior and our Lord. Five miracles in the book of Luke. This is the fourth of the five. This is a pretty interesting one. It's ten lepers who are healed by Jesus. You may recall back in Luke chapter 5, he heals one leper. So you've got ten times the power going on in this miracle. There are ten of them who are healed by Jesus. Incredible demonstration of the compassion and power of Christ. Luke's very purpose, that his readers might know. This is no ordinary man. This is the God-man. This is the Messiah. It's interesting, the ten lepers are healed. Just kind of an overview of the passage here a little bit. The ten lepers are healed Nine of them are satisfied with a temporal healing. Nine of them are satisfied and are probably thankful for the healing that has taken place in their life. And amazed and grateful. But only one of those ten goes back to Jesus. His thankfulness for what has happened becomes, becomes an avenue to his salvation. Interesting point here. It's possible to be thankful to God and not be saved. It's, thankful to be th- it's possible to be thankful to God and grateful to God, which many people are. You hear this all the time. I'm really thankful to God for this. He gave me a good job. He gave me a good wife. He's given me a good place to live. He's given me good kids. He's given me this. God has done this. A lot of people talk like that. God has done good things for me. But it doesn't mean they're saved. It doesn't mean they know God. It's just an expression they use. They're thankful for the temporal happiness they experience. But they don't care about the eternal life or happiness or hell that they may face. This one guy, he did. He was concerned. You see, for the the nine, their healing was a means to an end. A better temporal life for this one. His healing was a means to meet the Savior. (laughs) Pretty potent passage, wouldn't you say? Let's look at it this morning. Verse Verse 11 of chapter 17. While he was on the way to Jerusalem... 
He was passing between Samaria and Galilee. I don't want you to miss this again. I've brought it out before, but let me just say some more about it if I can. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, that is not just a geographical tidbit, okay? That is a very significant statement. That is a significant thread that runs through the book of Luke that speaks to the very purpose that Christ came to go to Jerusalem to die. That's why he came. It's like Luke is waving a banner every time he says that to remind the readers he's going to Jerusalem. It's not that he has not been to Jerusalem at different times throughout the passages here for the temple and other things he's done there. But when you read verses like this, and and let me turn with me back to Luke 9.22 for a moment, after Peter's confession, in verse 22 of Luke chapter 9, hold your hand there in Luke 17. Verse... 22, he says this, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. This is what's going to happen to me, he tells his disciples. Go to verse 31. After his discussion on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, they were appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Go to verse 44 of Luke 9. Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Verse 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. That's the thread, folks. That thread just runs through this book. Go to chapter 13, verse 22. He was passing through, through from one city and village to another, verse 22 of Luke 13 says, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. Then you have the account here in chapter 17. Now go to chapter 18, verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, And I say that, I point that verse out because that's on the road to Jerusalem. He's on the road to Jerusalem. A blind man was sitting there begging. Go to chapter 19, verse 11. It says Jesus was telling a parable in verse 11 because he was near Jerusalem. Verse 28 of chapter 19. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And then verse 41 says, and when he approached Jerusalem, he wept over the city. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, this is a banging the drum. You know, marching to Jerusalem. A lot of people will agree that Jesus came. At Christmas, we talk about Jesus coming into the world. But a lot of people don't tell you why he came. He came to go to Jerusalem to die. He came to die. And that has been the entire purpose of his coming into the world. He did not come just to be an example to us. That would do me no good. I need a sacrifice for my sin. I need the wrath of God poured out on a substitute in my place. And that's what happens with Jesus He came to be the ransom for many. He came to be the curse in our place. From the very moment, he was just a one-celled human being in the womb of Mary. This was his purpose. It wasn't some plan that went awry or something like that. It was the plan. The plan was to die. And Jerusalem was his destination, and that is where he was headed. He says, I came to do the Father's will, the Father's will. Jesus 
Jesus died for God before he died for you. You understand that? He died for God. He died to satisfy God's wrath. He died to satisfy God's holiness and God's justice. He died for God before he died for me. I get the effects of that because God's wrath is satisfied in Christ. And that's his whole purpose for coming to the world. That's the ultimate hope for Samaritan lepers, for Jewish lepers, for all sinners. Is Jesus went to Jerusalem to die. He was passing between, back to 1711, Luke 1711. He's passing through this area known as between Samaria and Galilee. He is basically in the northern section of Israel. Uh, You have Judea in the south, Samaria sort of in the middle, then Galilee in the north. Samaria, Samaria, the region where the Samaritans lived, the Samaritans who were Jews who were taken into captivity by the Assyrians, they intermarried with the Assyrians, so you have a mixed race people, half-breeds the Jews would call them, the Jews wanted nothing to do with them, the Jews would not even travel through their land, they worshipped in a different place than the Jews, Mount Gerizim, they only used the first five books of the law, they had some strange practices. There's still a a few of them left today. But the point is, that's where Jesus is. Jews wouldn't go into Samaria, but we know Jesus went there in John 4, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. But it it was very much a racial issue, and they wanted nothing to do with each other. But Jesus is in that region, and He's on his way to Jerusalem, so this is not a direct route, but he's still headed there. He has some divine appointments with some people before he gets there. And I mean divine appointments. These are not surprise. The sovereign, all-knowing God, these are divine appointments. This village, we don't know the name of this village. It's not given to us at the beginning of verse 12. Verse 12 tells us that there were 10 leprous men who stood at a distance and met him. You better believe they stood at a difference to meet him, a distance to meet him, because that's what lepers did. Lepers did not come close to anybody. In fact, the law says in Leviticus 13, 45, and 46, I mean, you know this is not inside the village because they couldn't live inside the village. They had to be outside the village, outside the city. And they would always be at a distance from people. Let me just read Leviticus 13 to you, 45 through 46. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered. He shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. So when you came upon a leper, he would say, unclean, unclean. You got ten guys yelling, unclean, unclean. And they're outside the village. And they're at a distance from people. Because that is exactly what the law says and required of lepers. These guys must have had full-blown leprosy for them to be at a distance outside the village. Leper, the word for leprosy, that word can mean some kind of skin infections. Minor to major. You get the impression we're talking full-blown leprosy here just because of the way they're behaving at a distance and it's very dangerous in these cultures people feared this stuff they were very much afraid of leprosy it's communicable you can catch it from people each other and They had to hang out together. The only people they could be with is other lepers. They couldn't be with families. They were were isolated. Isolated. You can't be with your family. You can't socialize with the community. You can't go into the synagogue and the temple. You can't do any of that if you've got leprosy. It was a scary, scary disease. And Leviticus... 13 and 14, if you want to read more about it, but that gives the prescription on how you deal with this, the prescription on how it was to be handled among the Jews.
And like I told you, there's severe types and there's less severe types. But what it does, it attacks the nerves and the skin. I've, I've told you about this before. We talked about the leper in Luke 5. Let me just refresh some of your memories on that. But the skin, what happens is it, it takes away your defense warning. It, it destroys the feeling in your extremities. It destroys the feeling in your hands. You know, you'd see lepers without fingers. It wasn't because the leprosy took the fingers away. It was because they tried to put their hand in a fire and couldn't feel it. Or it was because they, they tried to turn something too hard and it just, their fingers broke off because they couldn't feel nothing. Same with their feet and, and their face. They would rub their nose off almost. Some people say they look like lions. Because this was such a debilitating disease that took away all feeling. You, you know, your feeling, your nerves, all of that is, is a warning to you. Don't do that. Get your hand off that hot stove. They, had, they, they didn't have that. Their, their eyebrows would fall out. Um, they would it'd attack their throat, larynx. And they couldn't even, when they talked, it was a shrill sound, a growling sound. A rat could chew off their finger, they wouldn't even know it. You read in biblical times that it could wipe out a whole village. And God said, put them out. Naaman was a leper. As punishment, Uzziah was made a leper. It's very defiling. Isaiah uses it as a description of our sin, a disease. He calls our sin a disease. He uses leprosy uh, as a comparison to that because it affects the whole body, affects the whole man. That's what sin does to all of us. It's a disease we all have. So that comparison is made. I certainly would not say God, it was the thinking of the Jews that God is punishing you if you're a leper. I'm sure they felt that way. That's what was taught. Basically, you're blind. If you're blind, you're, God is punishing you. That was kind of their thinking, retribution theology. You're, you're sick because God made you that way, and he's punishing you for something. That was the thinking. That was the thinking. And when Jesus healed lepers, oh my goodness, the, the single leper back in Luke chapter 5, I, certainly God would not heal a leper, would be the thinking of the religious leaders. But Jesus even touched the leper there. He touched the leper there. He wasn't afraid of being defiled by the leper in Luke chapter 5. So, just like we need spiritual cleansing from our spiritual leprosy, these men need physical cleansing from their physical leprosy. And that's what they are doing here as they raise their voices in verse 13 and cry out to Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. See that? Verse 13. Feeble, raspy voices. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Master is a word that's referred to, refers to Christ. It's used by his disciples a lot. Speaks of someone who has authority, speaks of someone who has power. And that's what they're saying when they say master. They've, they know something about this Jesus who has come into their region. They recognize that this is one who has notable authority, one who has notable power. They've heard all about it. And their faith may be very meager, but they have no other option. They're in a horrible condition. They can't do anything for themselves. And so what do they do? They cry out to Jesus, have mercy. We just sang that song, Jim. Thank you. That song, great song. Thinking about mercy, mercy, you, used by people who want Jesus to uh, show his power, uh, people who want Jesus to deliver them from their condition. Have mercy. 
I can't save myself. I can't get myself out of the situation. I need you. It assumes that Jesus is approachable. They probably heard that this Jesus, when you cry out to him for mercy, he'll show you mercy. Not like the religious leaders who show no mercy, but this Jesus will show mercy. He listens to people who cry out for mercy. (laughs) I like that. Maybe some of you need to pray more and ask God for some mercy in your life right now. Maybe you're just going through a really hard time. And you need to quit looking everywhere else and look to him for mercy. Have mercy on me, Lord. I can't fix this. I can't change these circumstances. I can't get out of this. I can't do it, God. He's our merciful high priest. I love that. He's our merciful high priest. He recognizes our weak condition. Oh, man, that's, that's just a great sermon in itself right there. Think about that. But they're crying out to him. They want to be healed. They want to be healed. And they got some meager faith that says he can do that. I read a quote, commentary by Kent Hughes, excellent commentary on, this, on the book of Luke. It says this, they looked as though, when they came out, they looked as though they had climbed out of the graves. But they were alive. They were alive. Sensitive human beings. Feeling souls living in the netherworld of society's fringe while they rotted away. So from a safe distance, they shouted the traditional plea, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And they were loud, and they were persistent. Have mercy on us, have mercy, have mercy, please. Well, you know what? They're looking to the right one, aren't they? They're looking to the right one. Verse 14. When Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. Chapter 5, remember I told you, he touched the leper. And everybody gasped back then, by the way, when he did that. Oh, you don't touch a leper. He doesn't do that. Here to the ten, he says to them, he doesn't even say be healed. He says to them, go and show yourself to the priest. The priest were the health inspectors of their culture. The priests were the ones that would diagnose that little white spot on your body to determine if it was leprosy. And the priests would be the ones who would determine if your leprosy was gone and you could be declared clean again. They didn't get many of those, by the way. But they were the health inspectors. So this was Old Testament law, Leviticus 13 and 14. Go to the health inspectors. Jesus doesn't give any medicines here. He gives no washings here. He has no no formulas here. He just says, go to the priest. And that's the purpose to go. They're the health inspectors and and they will declare you clean. That is what he is saying to them, basically. So it took some faith to go from that point to to start walking down the road, right? At that moment, you're not healed, but you're going to the priest as if you are. It just says go. It's like the centurion said, you don't need to go to my servant. You can just say the words. You can just say the words. That's it here. Jesus just says the words. Go to the priest. So you can be declared healed. And so they do what Jesus tells them to do. And as they were going, you see that in verse 14, as they were going, they were cleansed. They were cleansed. Ten lepers, totally 
made clean and cleansed. And they were on their way to the priest to have that verified. And it would require eight days with the priest and some sacrificing, according to Luke, excuse me, according to Leviticus 13 and 14. Now, Jesus, you know, no faith is expressed here, but it's obvious they have some kind of meager faith here that would get them going down the road. Jesus, recall this now, Jesus heals a lot of people that do not exercise faith. He just declares them healed. In many situations, we see that, we've seen that in the book of Luke. Uh, when, God, when Jesus raises a man from the dead, there's no faith involved there. You understand that? Just raises him, right? I mean, so really, the faith, that is not the issue. That is not the issue. He does it to demonstrate his own power, his own glory, his own majesty, to draw attention to who he is, to, to, to verify the claims he is making in his preaching, that he is the Son of God. But this is very, very stunning and shocking moment. They're back whole again. <laughs> They'd be able to go back to their families. They would be able to go back to the social life of, Judea, of the Jewish society. They'd be able to go back to worship. But it tells us, it tells us in verse 15, something happens, one of them turns back. You see that in verse 15? This man is just as full of joy and wonderment as the other nine. Trying to process, though, what this means. Notice verse 15, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. He, he understands the real implications of what has happened here. You know what it is, folks? He realizes, man, I have just been in the presence of God. That's what he realizes. How do I know that? Because the way he worships. You don't worship a man the way he worships Jesus. You, that's reserved for God. He worships this man because this man is God. He worships this man because God is working through this man. He recognizes that I'm in the presence of God. I'm in the presence of deity. Now, I really believe that's the point there. That's why he comes back and does what he does. I, I, it's more than me just being healed of something temporal here. I have a spiritual need that also needs to be met. I understand alienation from society, but I have a deeper alienation, an alienation from God. And I want to be brought to God. He's not just my physical healer. I want him to be my redeemer. I want him to be my savior. So he glorifies God with a loud voice. That's something he, had, he was not able to do before. Before it was just a, a, a shrilly growling sound. Master, cleanse us. Master, help us. Master, have mercy on us. Now it's changed to expressive emotion. Glorifying God with a loud voice the top of his lungs. By the way, those lungs are obviously healed. He, he knew where this power came from. That is my point here, folks. He knew where the power came from. This Jesus is no mere man. It says he worshipped him, took that worshipping posture. It says in the verse, he fell down on his face at his feet giving thanks to him. A posture that says, I want you, I need you. He knew he was in the presence of God. The other nine guys are going to the temple. 
The other nine guys are, going, are, saying, are saying this. We are going to the temple, and there we will be able to worship God. Well, see, the reality is God had left that place a long time ago, Ichabod. God had left, departed that place a long time ago. They were going there to continue into in Judaism. This man knew where God dwelt. This man, this leper, this leper knew where God dwelt. It dwelt in this, he dwelt in this man, Jesus. And that's why he's on his face, bowed down, worshiping him. Folks, you see why I said at the beginning of this sermon this morning, thanksgiving to God and gratefulness to God can lead you to God or it can just lead you to, eternal, to temporal satisfaction with things in this life. And you will die and spend eternity away from God in hell. That's the difference between the one and the nine. For the nine, it was just a means to an end. Jesus' healing was just a temporal, was just a thing to make my temporal life better. For this man, it was, I needed more, it was more, it was more. Uh, it's more than just physical alienation because of my leprosy. No, I want to be, I don't want to be spiritually alienated anymore. You know, this happens. This happens to all of you, and me, myself included. I get so thankful to God for the things He gives me. I get so focused on the gifts and not the giver, right? I like the gifts, I don't like the giver all the time, right? It's the attitude that says, Give me these things, but I'm not going to bow down and worship you. It's almost like our society has this entitlement attitude God owes us these things. But I would never bow down and worship this God. You see the difference? That's what's going on here in a sort of a, this kind of situation. It's a difference between getting a blessing from this deity and going back and honoring and worshiping this deity. So, so this man, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is this man is a picture to us of true conversion. True conversion. He returns to Jesus, honoring Jesus, thanking Jesus. Yes, the others were thankful, but it was just a means to an end. This healing led this man to what really mattered. His conversion. How do you know that, Rod? We'll, we'll get there. Verse 19. But verse 16. Fell on his face. Notice what it says in verse 16. He was a Samaritan. Oh, now you tell us. A footnote. Here we have an outcast. Here we have one that is outside of the religious establishment. One who is most hated by the Jews. A stranger, foreigner, it's translated the next verse. A heathen, a pagan. If there's anyone who God would never heal, it would be a Samaritan. And that's one of the biggest reasons they didn't think Jesus was God. He can't be who he claims to be because he hangs out with tax gatherers and sinners, and now he's gone and healed a Samaritan. God would never do that especially a Samaritan that's a leper. Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans normally unless you're a leper and you just all hang out together. And that's what this man was doing with these other nine who were Jews. There's no way a Samaritan is one of God's children would be the attitude but he's the only one in the group that is a real child of God. That's what this scene is telling us. And that is what Jesus is doing in this. It's just showing the contrast, the contrast of who is truly converted and who's not. And this, this, leper, this leprous Samaritan knew Jesus was not a racist. 
He knew Jesus was not a racist. And you got to think about it. This, this Samaritan, for him to come to Jesus, he had to bypass everything he'd been taught in his religion about Mount Gerizim and how you worshiped at Mount Gerizim. And then he had to bypass everything he'd heard these Jews probably telling him about worship in Jerusalem. I mean, he had to get past all of that religious baggage to come to Jesus and see Jesus as being indwelt by God. Excuse me, Jesus is God. Seeing Jesus is God. Jesus being the temple of God to whom he would worship. He had to get past all of that religious baggage. And, and I think many people have to get past religious baggage to come to Christ. You, you can't depend on the religion of your father, your grandfather, or your all the things you've been taught in the past. Sometimes you've got to let all that go. You've got to let all that go to come to Christ. Because sometimes it just gets in the way. He let all that go. It didn't matter. He came to Christ. Verse 17, Jesus asked the rhetorical questions here just to show this contrast I'm trying to describe to you this morning. Were there not ten cleansed? See that in verse 17? But the nine, where are they? Ten cleansed? Where are those nine at? So he's just exposing the true and the false. Weren't there ten who were cleansed? There's only one here. The nine no longer have any interest in Jesus. This one does. The nine have no desire to worship Jesus. This one does. See the contrast? He's trying clarification. True and false. Who truly believes? And that's, the, that's like I said earlier, is the attitude of a lot of people. Just give me what I deserve. I don't want this man to reign over me, though. I don't want to worship this man. Just give me what I deserve. I'm, my temporal happiness is all that matter is what matters to me most. I do not want to reign, have this man to reign over me. And that's the kind of savior that a lot of people are offering out there by the way. A savior who will make your life the best life now. Right? And that's what Jesus is going to ask people one day. Where have you been? Where did you go? Who have you been loving? To whom were you devoted? Where were you? I never knew you. I never knew you. And see, the, the word in verse 18, he uses the word foreigner. Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? If you ever went to the temple, you would see a sign that said, no access to foreigners. You couldn't go in there to worship because you're a foreigner. Now, there was a place of the Gentiles within the temple compound, but generally it was off limits to Gentiles, off limits especially to Samaritans. But as a, as a, as a foreigner, you had no access to the inner court. You had no access to the sacrificing and worship of God. And what's interesting is this, this foreigner, this leper, healed leper, this Samaritan healed leper, he never makes it to Jerusalem. He never makes it to the priest. He doesn't need to. You, you don't need the law to be justified. You don't need to try to keep the law to be justified. He did not have to go to the priest. And Jesus doesn't condemn him for it. He just does not go to the priest, the health inspectors. He doesn't have to go there. He goes directly to Christ because no one is justified by the law. For this man's justification, all he needed was Christ and faith in Christ and believing in Christ. They go back to their cold, blind religion. This man comes to Christ. And that's why he says in verse 19, 
Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. The word well is not a good translation of that word sozo. The word is for salvation. It refers to salvation. It, it can be used in lesser terms sometimes in some places, but generally it's, all, it's, it's referring to salvation. Your faith has saved you. It's the same word. You can look it up. 750 of Luke. It says there, your faith has saved you. Same word is used there. Your faith has saved you. It wouldn't make any sense to say, your faith has made you well. Well, the other nine are well. This man, there's a distinction about this man. He has been saved. He has experienced salvation. And so, his humility, his commitment, he embraces Jesus as Lord. See, some people just want Jesus to be an errand boy who fixes their problems, but they don't want him to be Lord to whom they bow down to. And this man, this man bowed down and he was saved. When you think about this in terms of spiritual leprosy, sin, we all have a need to be cleansed of our sin. Sin is what separates us from God just as physical leprosy separated people from each other and society, alienation. Our sin alienates us from God, and only Christ, only Christ can bring us to God. Faith and trust in Christ, just like this leper. And the only way to be cleansed is through Christ. Has that happened to you? Have you been cleansed by Christ? Or do you still have leprosy? Have you been cleansed by Christ? Or are you still alienated from God? It's our invitation to you that you would put your faith and trust in Christ, just like this leper did. Bow down and worship Christ, just like this leper did, and find salvation in Christ alone. God, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for this tremendous scene where we've seen the contrast of true faith and false faith. We've seen the contrast, God, between those who are thankful for temporal reasons and those who are thankful for both temporal and eternal reasons. We thank you and praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.